Thank you. Uh, I think I'll stand here, and uh, let me just say it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is what we're talking about, and uh, I have a lot to talk about, and I'll be going through a lot of these slides very quickly. Let me say it, it's a great pleasure to be here with so many distinguished scientists uh, presenting today. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> U.S. and international safety guidelines are based on only thermal heating effects. Uh, but there are many non-thermal effects that occur at levels orders of magnitude below, lower than those allowed by the guidelines. And, uh, and, and what I'm going to talk about here are a series of eight effects that where, where there are large numbers of published reviews that have reported these. That is, we have an extraordinary amount of evidence that's been reported over and over and over again in these reviews on lowered fertility uh, caused by various kinds of changes uh, and uh, neurological and neuropsychiatric effects also uh, producing uh, uh, quite a number of changes. Um, cellular DNA damage of three types single and double-stranded breaks and oxidized, oxidized bases in the DNA. Uh, 21 different reviews here, 25, 18, 13 reviews on programmed cell deaths, apoptosis, which is also uh, pronounced apoptosis, depending on, on one's preference. Oxidative stress, free radical damage, 19 reviews on that. Uh, you get uh, a variety of different endocrine, that is hormonal effects, 12 different reviews have been published on these. Excessive intracellular calcium, uh, 15 reviews on that. This is the cause of almost everything else that I'm going to be talking about. And, uh, and 35 reviews on cancer, uh, published uh, all the way from the 1970s up until the present. Um, so why are we still discussing whether these things exist. They clearly exist. Um, pulsed EMFs, EMFs that pulse up and down, as has been already discussed, um, are in most cases much more biologically active than non-pulsed or continuous wave EMFs. <clears throat> there are 13 reviews on that. Because all wireless communication devices communicate via pulsations, they are potentially, and I believe actually, much more dangerous. All of this stuff, everything I've said, of course, is ignored by the industry and by many of the agencies that are supposed to be regulating this. Um, <clears throat> there are four other probable effects where you, you have substantial evidence, but not the kind of overwhelming evidence that are present in those eight. There are cardiac effects that work via the electrical control of the heart. Uh, there, uh, very early onset Alzheimer's and other dementias. Uh, I'll talk about those briefly. Uh, ADHD and autism, um, I'll argue, are caused by uh, pre <coughs> late prenatal and early postnatal EMF exposures and that they're critical things that are going on in the developing brain uh, that are responsible for those. Um, <coughs> okay, so how then does all of this work? And uh, there are 28 different studies that have shown that, the, that various kinds of non-thermal effects of microwave and also other frequency EMFs can be blocked by or greatly lowered by using calcium channel blockers. These are drugs that are specific for blocking the, uh, what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. I'll often abbreviate those VGCCs. And these are, uh, there are five different types of calcium channel blockers that have been used in these studies, each having a distinct structure, each binding to a different site. The only thing that is known or even postulated about these that are in common is they all block these channels. And so when you find these effects blocked or greatly lowered, that tells you something very profound, namely that the EMFs are activating via VGCC activation and allowing calciums to flow into the cell. So these are our channels in the plasma membrane that surround all of our cells and uh, such that when they open, you get a huge amount of calcium flowing into the cell. 
Why? Because there's a 10,000 fold concentration gradient driving calcium into the cell and there's actually over a million fold electrochemical gradient driving calcium into the cell. So you open these channels, whoosh, you get huge amounts of calcium going in. Normally that only happens for very short time periods in order to regulate things, but when you overactivate these with the EMS, all hell breaks loose. And that's basically, I think, where we are. Now, there are also, let me just say, there are also other voltage-gated ion channels that are activated. The primary, the primary effects seem to go through calcium. There are some effects, however, that are produced by the other channels as well. We have a, a, now evidence for eight different channels, each of which has a similar voltage sensor uh, that controls the opening of the channel and each of which are activated via, via the, uh, the uh, EMFs. And so, uh, and I'll, I'll argue that the, uh, <coughs> that the bullet sensor is the primary direct target of the EMFs. Um, <clears throat> now let me just say, we have a wide range of frequencies that go through this mechanism. And they range all the way from the millimeter wave frequencies that 5G will entail through microwave, radio frequency, intermediate frequency, extremely low frequencies from our power wiring, and even static electrical fields and static magnetic fields when they produce pathophysiological effects. Uh, as best we can tell, they primarily go through this mechanism and they can all be therefore blocked or greatly lowered by calcium channel blockers. Uh, <clears throat> So this is kind of an amazing and surprising finding that they all seem to have. We have one primary direct target of the EMFs uh, and, uh, and that's the voltage sensor and that most of the effects are produced through the calcium channels. Okay, now, um, okay, there are, other, there are other evidence that we really don't have time to talk about, but what I want to focus on now is uh, the voltage sensor. Why is the voltage sensor so sensitive to these EMFs? And let me just say, the industry acknowledges that microwaves and lower frequency EMFs can put forces on positive and negatively charged groups, but states that the forces produced by the low intensity EMFs are too low to produce biological effects. And what I'm going to do is to show why this is not true for the actual target, namely the voltage sensor. Uh, this is a model uh, that, uh, of the voltage sensor, and let me just say this is produced by a, by a, uh, a professor in the UK. And uh, this model I use basically because it's understandable, not because it's, it's accurate in all respects. In fact, it's not accurate in most, most all respects. What you can see here is that these, these channels, these voltage-gated calcium channels, are made up of <coughs> four different very similar domains this one, this one, this one, and this one. And they actually wrap around each other, uh, sort of into a, into a cylinder. That's not what's shown here. And these, uh, these blue and uh, orange colored uh, cylinders are alpha helices. So this is a structure in the protein. Uh, and the reason that they're colored differently is because this orange one has a bunch of positive charges on it, plus, 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 et cetera. There are five positive charges in each of those. Those four helices are collectively the voltage sensor. And those four helices are all tilted in the membrane, and that's very important, because what it means is all these charges are within, actually, the lipid part of the membrane, the fatty part of the membrane. That's very important for two reasons. One is that the forces on those charges is inversely proportional to the dielectric constant of the medium they're in. The dielectric constant of this fatty part of the membrane is about 1 120th of the dielectric constant of the aqueous parts of the cell and our, and our body. So this is aqueous, that's aqueous. The forces are about 120 times stronger because these things are within this lipid environment. Secondly, uh, there's another thing that's going on here. And uh, so these factors mean that the forces are much greater because they're 20 charges, not just one. So you've got lots of charges. 
uh, they're 120 times stronger because of this Coulomb's law, dielectric constant. And then there's another factor that's even larger, approximately 3,000 fold factor, because the plasma membrane has a very high electrical resistance, and the, uh, and whereas the aqueous phase has high conductivity, and therefore the electrical gradients are highly amplified right across the plasma membrane. This comes out of Ohm's law. So the, we're talking about old laws of physics, okay? We're talking about uh, Coulomb's law that was uh, first stated in 1784, uh, sorry, 1784, and Ohm's law that dates from the 1830s, right? So all old physics turns out to be extremely important here because of the, um, oops, sorry, the uh, approximately 7.2 million times stronger than the forces on singly electrically charged groups in the aqueous parts of the cell. And uh, so, uh, you know, so, uh, so uh, and the safety guidelines uh, allow us to be exposed to, to heating, and heating is produced predominantly by the forces on the singly charged groups. So what that means is that, at least roughly speaking, the safety guidelines are allowing us to be exposed to levels that are something like 7.2 million times too high. That's quite a fit. Even the industry might agree with that, although I wouldn't guarantee it. Now, um, there was some interesting, an interesting paper I just wanted to point out. There's a, 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 a paper published by Takia et al. in 2016, which showed that isolated plasma membranes, complete cell-free system, no cells, just the membrane, <coughs> you could activate the VGCCs by irradiating with three different microwave frequency EMFs. So what that says, this is a direct effect on the VGCCs. There's no regulation involved. There's no cellular processes involved. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, as I say, uh, this is almost certainly due to a direct effect on the voltage sensor. Now, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Panagopoulos has published two very important papers in 2000 and 2002 to argue that, that these voltage-gated ion channels, including the VGCCs, are very important targets. And, uh, and so this is, uh, I think, very prescient and important information. Um, now, <clears throat> how does it work? How do you get these effects? Uh, we've got microwave and lower frequency EMFs acting via VGCC activation, producing excessive calcium in the cell. And there are two main pathways that are involved in producing the pathophysiological effects. Uh, one is that uh, when you have excessive calcium, you get ex excessive calcium signaling. Calcium signaling is extremely important in every single eukaryotic cell on the planet, including every single animal cell, every single plant cell, etc. And so when you get excessive calcium signaling, you got lots of problems. Uh, those are very important here. In addition, uh, excessive calcium here produces high levels of nitric oxide and superoxide. These two react with each other to form proxy nitrite, which is a potent oxidant. Uh, proxy nitrite then breaks down to, to form reactive free radicals, uh, and uh, they produce oxidative stress, and, uh, and uh, they activate NF kappa B. So you get inflammation, you get oxidative stress, you get free radical damage. Free radical damage, by the way, is the mechanism that produces the DNA effects. Okay, so uh, so you get you get each of the DNA effects that have been discussed uh, through the uh, free radical attacks on the DNA. Okay, um, now. I want to say I think uh, uh, this has already been discussed, so I'll just, I'll just uh, say there are four reasons why EMFs are more active in children than in adults. Higher surface to volume ratio, higher density of stem cells. The younger you are, the more the de more, higher the density. Stem cells are very, very sensitive to these EMFs. Uh, the developing brain appears to be especially sensitive. I'll talk briefly about that later. And the tissues in young tissues, uh, sorry, in young individuals have high, higher water content. And that basically means that the, that the EMFs penetrate more effectively into those tissues to produce effects. So all of those things say that children are more sensitive. Uh, of course, the industry denies everything I have to say, including that. Uh, I, have, I have a table here which talks about various kinds of effects and how those can be generated 
through that path, those pathways that we've talked about. Um, and I don't really have time to talk about these, so this is just basically to say, hey, I'm not just giving you crap. There is, in fact, some, some reason to, to think these things are, are applicable to producing these specific effects. Okay, so let's go on. One of the things I think that's particularly of concern, I think this was already discussed briefly, is that quite a number of these effects, based on the best available evidence, are cumulative. That is, when you have long or repeated exposures to a particular type and level of, uh, of, of, of EMF, the effects become more and more severe with time. Just the same, same exposures, just longer times. And, uh, and as they become more severe, uh, they apparently become irreversible. This is therefore producing absolutely horrendous situations. And uh, um, so I think, and I, I really don't have time to discuss this, we are facing three existential threats that are imminent in all technologically advanced societies, and there are probably others as well. One is a crash in our collective brain function. A second is a crash in our reproductive function. And I use that term crash advisedly. And a third is the possible impacts of these EMFs on our gene pool because of the mutations that occur in germline cells that we know occur. We know the DNA effects occur in germline cells, and we know these DNA effects can produce mutations. So uh, this one, I don't know how far along it is. These two, I, I would argue, we already have good evidence that they're quite far along and in, 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 in very chilling ways. So uh, let's talk about the neurological, neuropsychiatric effects. We have all of these effects, insomnia, fatigue, depression, headache, lack of concentration, cognitive dysfunction, anxiety, stress, memory dysfunction, etc. These are things I, I reported in my 2016 study, but they've also been reported in at least uh, seven or eight other reviews. Uh, and, uh, and so th there's, there's extensive information, not just from one or two types of EMS, but from, from many different types of EMS, produce very similar effects. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking now specifically about microwave frequency EMFs. Um, this is my, and, and, and when you look at animals, exposed to these kinds of fields. What you find is that there are major changes in the brain structure that become more and more severe with time, that become irreversible with time. And this has been known since 1973. And we're still ignoring all this stuff. I estimate that uh, it's probably something like five to seven years until we see a crash in our collective brain function in which case my prediction is we're going to go into utter chaos. Um, that estimate could be off by quite a bit in either direction. Um, some people have asked me, is our collective brain function already deteriorated to the point where we can't deal with this? And I, and I can't answer that question. I mean, certainly what we've seen so far is not encouraging. Um, Let's talk about ADHD and autism. Um, and I, I really don't have much time to talk about this, but let me just say, my, uh, okay, I believe that both uh, microwave frequency EMFs and also chemicals can have roles. That the main way in which they act is through excessive intracellular calcium. I believe the main driver of the epidemic is microwave frequency EMF exposures, but reasonable people may differ on that. But I'm, I'm saying both of these are involved. And that the main uh, impact of the intracellular calcium is on the synapse formation. And the reason that I think that this is true is because there are five different mechanisms which are known to regulate the formation of the synapses in the developing brain, every single one of these is controlled by intracellular calcium. So every single one of these can get screwed up by having excessive calcium in the cell. Uh, if this is right, obviously we're in incredible trouble here. And, uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure I have time to talk about Wi-Fi. 
but uh, basically Wi-Fi produces seven of the eight effects that we discussed before, uh, plus a number of other effects. And, uh, and so Wi-Fi is a, is, a, uh, is, a, is a serious threat to human health. And, uh, okay, let's talk about 5G. In order to talk about 5G, you have to understand what 5G is, or at least will be according to all the plans. The idea behind 5G is, first of all, to use much higher frequencies, what are called millimeter wave frequencies. And the reason that the industry wants to go to these millimeter wave frequencies is because the much higher frequency that is there will allow them to use much higher pulsations and therefore communicate much more information per unit time. So you can communicate very large amounts of information per unit time. And, uh, and so because of that, we are guaranteed that, uh, that we're, we're talking about extraordinary levels of pulsation and therefore, at least potentially, and I think actually, extraordinary biological effects. Um, in addition to that, these, these this, uh, millimeter wave uh, frequencies uh, have the property that they're, they're highly absorbed by materials. Now, these things, the way these things get absorbed predominantly is by interacting with charged groups. So, it's reasonable then to predict that the 5G frequencies will involve high levels of activation of the bullet sensor because that's the way it works through interaction with charged groups. So I predict that it's problematic for both of those reasons. And in addition to that, um, uh, you know, th that, uh, that the, the whole idea, the whole problem with this high level of absorption means that the, that the industry plans, and these have already been approved in the U.S. by the FCC and the Congress, uh, to put out tens of millions of these all over the place so we will not be able to avoid them. And the idea is that the only way they can penetrate into all of our houses and buildings is to have these things all over the place and very close by. So there will be extraordinarily high levels of radiation, of radiation that, that I think is, is going to be extraordinarily dangerous. Um, now, the industry claims that 5G will be largely absorbed in the outer one millimeter of the body. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is, yeah, there's some truth to that, but there's also a lot of falsehood to it. Um, to the extent that it's true, small, in a small organism, insects, small mammals, and birds will be much more impacted than we will. Uh, plants, where the EMFs work very similarly to the way they work in our bodies, will also be heavily impacted. Even large trees, their leaves and their reproductive organs are highly exposed. So they will be highly impacted. I predict that there will be absolute, absolute ecological disasters from this that will have, will, have, will have whole ecosystem collapses because of the effects on a variety of different animals and plants. Um, now, um, is it the case that the effects will be limited to the outer one millimeter of the body? Let me just say, the industry's been claiming that microwave frequencies only go in about a centimeter. And we know that's not true. And the best, the best evidence on that is some, some studies that Professor Hessig and his colleagues published in Switzerland, uh, in two studies, in which they showed that uh, uh, the pregnant cat, a cow, grazing near cell phone tower, produces large numbers of newborn calves with cataracts. Okay, so the fetus is buried very deeply in the mother's body. Nothing should happen, according to the industry. Uh, you know, it's, it's buried something like 40 times deeper than you need to be, according to the industry, in order to pr completely protect it. And yet, we're getting high levels of, of these things. Yeah. And so, where, where are we here? Um, so how does, you know, so, so it's very clear that the effects, in fact, go much deeper than the industry claims. And the question then is, how can this work? And I think the answer is actually quite simple, and again, it comes out of the physics. Um, 
The electrical parts of the EMFs are highly absorbed. The magnetic parts are not. The magnetic parts are very deeply penetrating, and that's been known for decades. I think the magnetic parts basically will put forces on electrically charged groups, on ions dissolved in the, in the aqueous phases. And what do they do? They move them. They put forces on them. And when they do that, what they do is they regenerate the electrical parts of the EMFs. Same frequency, same pulsations, just much lower intensity. But when you have a voltage sensor that's 7.2 million times more effective, has more forces than singly charged groups, it is incredibly sensitive. You can produce um, uh, these dense things. So, um, so on all of those bases, I'd argue you're going to get a lot of effects, both of the types we already have, and also perhaps of, of uh, somewhat different types. And uh, the current plan, already approved by the FCC and the Congress in the U.S., to put out tens of millions of, of 5G antenna without doing one single biological safety test. Europe and East Asia seem to be following similar paths. This, in my view, is absolute insanity. Thank you very much.